sometimes I'll use like a Crash of Doom, 21 inch. Oh, nice. Pieces, or even a stack of two Crashes of Dooms. I really dig the bigger kind so of stuff. So much Doom. So much Crashing of Doom. Too much Doom. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 180 Drums podcast. I am your host, Jake Nicole. I'm also the host of 180drums.com, where we offer online drum lessons with the best drummers in the world. And more importantly, we offer lessons that have some structure and are super easy on the budget and great on your schedule. So head over to 180drums.com. And if you want today's show notes, we are talking with Jeff Randall. Now, if you head to 180drums.com forward slash Jeff Randall, his last name is spelled R-A-N-D-A-L-L, we have an amazing sneak peek behind the scenes at what Jeff's kit looks like, the gear that he's using, but also some just great shots for us drum nerds where you get to really get close, check out his gear, check out how he's filming these videos and what his, he's at, Jeff's actually filming the stuff in a storage facility. So all of that and more is worth checking out. We're also going to have links in the pod, in the uh, podcast show notes to some amazing clips of Jeff playing, stuff that he's most proud of, as well as uh, a really, really cool, uh, almost semi-documentary that he had to do for a school project all about Steve Jordan. So you guys got to check that out. Again, head to 180drums.com forward slash Jeff Randall. But guys, in today's show with Jeff, we're going to be talking about routines, we're going to be talking about networking, we're going to be talking about how to essentially become somewhat Instagram famous as Jeff has become. But he's done that with some seriously hard work. He studied under Ed Sof at the University of North Texas. And I mean, there's just so many great things that I actually just re-listened to the whole podcast before doing this because I felt like... There was a lot even for me to take away, and uh, I love chatting with Jeff. He's such a good dude. So if you guys have questions, please feel free to comment. Again, the link is 180drums.com forward slash Jeff Randall. Uh, so you guys can feel free to hit us up there. I will do my best to write you guys back ASAP. Uh, without further ado, Jeff Randall. Hey guys, welcome to 180 Drums. Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, I've got Jeff with us. Jeff, what's going on, man? Hey, what's going on, Jake? Thanks so, for having me. Dude, it's so great to have you on here. And Jeff and I were just laughing before we got on this podcast. We were laughing because Jeff was saying that there's there's this little bit of a... Uh, he's trying to overcome some of those, these feelings of wanting to be more comfortable networking, be more comfortable getting into calls with people and chatting. And if you guys don't know Jeff, you got to go check out his drumming. I mean, you already heard the intro where I introduced Jeff and talk about how amazing he is. But um, right now, I just want to reestablish to say that Jeff's a sick drummer, but we were talking about networking. So, Jeff, what are some things you've been doing to improve your ability to network as a drummer? Man, that's a great question. Um, really, namely just reaching out to folks, just saying hi, like learning what I can from friends I've made on Instagram, especially. Wow. You know, um, Brian Carter's got an Instagram out there who I'm really starting to get to know. Um, and man, once I started kind of texting back and forth with Brian after we met kind of through Instagram, yeah, he just was a super confident, nice, goofy dude. And to me, a total stranger. And I kind of learned from that, that, uh, you know, I can be myself and put myself out there and say hi to a bunch of guys that don't know me. And I don't have to worry. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I'm being perceived. Just be yourself. And so I guess to boil it down, I'm learning from other people that I feel like are good at it. You know? Great. Now, for, for anyone who doesn't know who Brian is, why don't you give us a background on Brian? Man, the best I can give you would be he studied at Juilliard. He lives up in New York, and he's just a killer jazz drummer. Um, I think uh, I think his Instagram handle is Brian Carter Jazz. I'd have to double check that, but um, <laughs> you guys got to find him. He has the hashtag uh, Young Swangers, uh, S W A N G E R S. Uh, you can find him there. But uh, anyway, he just got an awesome Instagram, and uh, he's an inspirational dude, man. Um, so. Yeah, that's as much as I can give you. I'm still getting to know him, honestly. That's great. No, that's cool, man. Now, with the whole networking thing, uh, it's funny that right away we brought up Instagram because that's how you and I met. 
And yeah. we're living in a different time than five years ago and a different time five years ago than 10 years ago. It's constantly evolving. So what are some things that you're doing to stay on top of the curve? I mean, maybe you should share about the fact that you put up a new Instagram video, I think, every day. Is that right? I try to. Yeah. I try to do it daily as a part of a routine. Stop I'll, uh, the madness. <laughs> yeah, man. And I, you know, I didn't start on Instagram. I've been... Um, producing videos for YouTube for some time and I try to do some pretty heavily produced like drum lesson videos and drum cover videos on YouTube for a couple years then didn't get a lot of traction um you know definitely had some cool supporters out there but it wasn't until maybe six months ago when I started posting a couple videos to Instagram that for whatever reason that little 15 second window was where it was at at least for me I guess so yeah after I kind of experimented a little bit with my iPhone, I realized, hey, I can put, you know, I can put the production skills yes. that I've learned from YouTube in, into Instagram, you know? So, uh, yeah, I wake up every morning. I wake up at 7 a.m. Um, I put on some music as I drink coffee. I try to read a chapter out of a book to just kind of get inspired. Oh, to great. And shed. Let's talk about that, but I'm going to stop you right there because let's talk about some of your routines. So, and don't let me forget that I do want to ask you more about the drum cover thing. We're going to get into that. But uh, what what does your morning routine look like? What kind of books would you read? Right now, I'm just reading, and I got it right here. I'm reading Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People right now. Yeah, you are. That's awesome. <laughs> Never Dale, read that one. Dale Carnegie, for anyone who doesn't know, a phenomenal author. You like, you have to go check out his work. It is some of the most – I mean I listen to a lot of business podcasts and I listen to a lot of podcasts uh, with philanthropists and different people and all of them talk so much about you know Dale Carnegie. So uh, that's awesome, man. So you wake up. What time do you usually get up at? I try to get up at 7.00. Seven. Earlier if possible. Okay. But yeah, basically, I mean, I work um, I work at an Apple store out here in Nashville, huh. and I have them schedule me later in the day. So I go out to Apple. I work like 1 to 10. I'm always doing the closing shifts there. Wow. And um, so that allows me to wake up really early to, uh, yeah, like I said, kind of have coffee, read a chapter, um, and then head to a storage facility, <laughs> which Crazy. is where my drums are set up. And I'm in this like dungeon for, you know, an hour or two. I kind of practice and eventually I'll fall into a groove, a feel that I feel like, all right, I could record this today. Cool. And, uh, I, I wrap it up there. I go to the gym for a bit. I go back to my place. I edit it and upload it sometime that day and go into work. So that's Gnarly. a schedule. So, okay, when, you're, when you get up, you get up at 7, the first half an hour of your day, some coffee and a book kind of thing, and then you're on the road. How far away is your facility that you practice at? It's close. It's okay. like five, five minutes, ten minutes. Do you walk there? Do you drive there? I drive over there. Okay, cool. So you drive over there, and you practice for how long? It really depends. I don't want to be there any longer than I have to. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, because I do feel like there is a – it's not just physical, but there's kind of a mental fatigue that sets in, for yeah. me at least. So I think I'm good for, you know, hour to two hours, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, so I'll warm up a bit for maybe half an hour and then kind of start to jam to tunes. And cool. I kind of, I change, you know, what I'm practicing, how I'm practicing. I feel like on a day-to-day -day basis. But right. I do think that I rely on where my, I guess, where my instincts take me in the practice room a lot of the time, you know, I'll kind of yeah. try to isolate certain things that I'm struggling with, you know, Very cool. as I'm out. Yeah, that's great, man. Now, what's your, what's, uh, okay, let's talk maybe influences. What, who are some of the drummers that inspire you the most present day versus, you know, guys that you had, you know, maybe some phases of. So for me, I went through big Keith Carlock phase when I was like 18, 17, 18, 19, something like that. Uh, went through a big Steve Jordan phase. Now, you know, went through the Stanton Moore phase. What about you? What are some guys that you've been into? Well, I mean, my main dude is definitely Steve Jordan. Cool. I did my, my college uh, thesis wow. <laughs> at, the, uh, at the University of North Texas for uh, Ed Self on Steve Jordan. I did like this cool – you can go check that out on YouTube, guys. If you go uh, find my channel on YouTube, uh, Jeff Randall, you'll see my thesis on Steve Jordan, which is kind of – Basically, where I show you audio examples of like an old school, 
you know, Stax track or an old school Motown track. And then I kind of side by side compare it to a newer Steve Jordan track um, and kind of show you, you know, where he's coming from. Get out Uh, of here. You know what, guys? That's going to be in the show notes so that you can check that out. What's the link? So YouTube.com slash, is it just Jeff Randall? I think you could do Jeff Randall music. You Jeff could Randall do slash music. Jeff Randall music, yeah. Okay, great. And what's the title of this uh, this thing here? It's called The Secret to Steve Jordan's Sound, I believe. Love it's it. Too- cool. Okay, great. That'll be in the show note for you guys for sure to check that out. That's uh, that's awesome, man. Steve Jordan's sound. Okay, so Steve Jordan. Who else? What are the other guys? You know, a lot of guys kind of like him too. J.J. Johnson is completely underrated and not enough people know about him and he's he's right up there with steve man now, he know? was really sick for a while right physically sick wasn't he you I know, know i didn't hear him yeah that. he was sick for a little bit and i mean jj if you're listening we love you man i hope that everything's cool with you but i know that he uh that he for a little while i guess just was was ill i heard that there was like a kickstarter or something to help raise some funds for him so, um, but JJ's on the live in LA DVD with John Mayer. That was where I became hip. Uh, yep. JJ's just amazing feel. I think he's, I think he's playing with, uh, David Ryan Harris whenever David Ryan Harris is playing, who used to be one of John Mayer's guitar players. Um, and you said that you studied with Ed Sof. Now that's really cool because Ed Sof was the same teacher. This is the university of Texas. Is that right? Yeah. University of North Texas, North Texas. That's the same teacher that taught, and kind of raised up Keith Carlock. So that's cool, man. What was your experience like studying with Ed? It was awesome. It was really awesome, man. I don't think I could fully appreciate it. I think I was a little I was a little too young, I think. I don't know. I think people develop <laughs> at different stages, but I went to UNT being kind of a, a church drummer. I grew up hmm. playing rock music in church, and uh, my band director in high school was also a percussionist. And uh, he was really influential on me auditioning for UNT, uh, North Texas and, and Belmont and some other uh, schools. And uh, anyway, yeah, got accepted to UNT and I show up and I'm surrounded by these dudes that some of them have been gigging, you know, jazz gigging for years, you know, wow. and I, and obviously I was not doing that. So with Ed, it was pretty wild, man, because Ed just kind of, I think his entire goal is to, just allow you to to discover your weaknesses, kind of put you on the spot in the lesson, you know, and he's all about um, motifs. Start with a simple motif, like hmm. boom, t- boom, t- 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 boom, t- boom, t- and just expand on that with uh, different limbs and different approaches. He's just really into improvisation, which, you know, I wasn't practicing a whole lot at the time, you know. But uh, it's pretty awesome. That's very cool, man. That's something that even for myself lately, I've been working on is a lot of motif stuff because it's so fun. It's such a fun way to practice and it's a way to really quickly expose some weak spots. So speaking of weak spots, uh, what were other areas where motifs is one thing. What else was it that Ed walked you through or what were some of the things that you found you struggled with the most developing as a drummer? Well, I just think there's a totally different technique or at least for me, there was a totally different technique um, for jazz than there there was for me playing rock. You know, you have to really develop your finger control. You yeah. know, a lot lighter um, touch, and it just took me probably took me a couple years to really start to get the hang of that. You know, crazy. So a lot of my practice time was just independence exercises, like the John Riley book. Man, that's yes. a book. Um, and uh, he had a lot of, um, man, I'm forgetting a lot of these books, but, you know, UNT has a syllabus you guys could check out if you ever wanted to of the books you go through with that. Um, and the John Riley book was definitely one of them. Um, but, yeah, I would really just say the independence required to play jazz was a completely new deal and the technique behind it as well. And to this day, man, I don't really uh, – I wouldn't consider myself a jazz drummer, you know, Um I, I did the best I could, and I definitely felt like I got the hang of it while at UNT after a certain period of time. But after I left, you know, I gigged out in Texas for a while, and I moved out to Nashville a couple years ago. And uh, I don't play as much jazz as I do other things, you know. So 
it's one of those things you got to be diligent to keep up with or it, it goes, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, man, cool. So who are some other drummers that, that excited you? Who are some other guys that got you really, really pumped to practice? So we talked about Steve Jordan, talked about Ed Sof's influence on you, J.J. Johnson. Who else? That's right. I just love I love guys that kind of have that soulful quality. So, I mean, we could go into rock guys like like John Theodore. I really dig Great. those guys too. You know what I mean? He's yeah. kind of bringing an old school vintage sound, but with a lot of modern drumming, you know? Yes. But, uh, you know, growing up, I loved Chad Sexton. I loved um, Jose Pasais of Incubus. That, that Chad Sexton's 311, Jose's Incubus. A lot of those kind of drummers, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, at, you know, at the core, I think I'm a kind of a soul rock dude. And I want to, I love Mitch Mitchell, you know? I love um, Buddy Miles. Hmm. So I really want to keep developing that. I, I'd love to be that kind of drummer, I guess, too artists I could play with. Very cool. I feel like I've been I've seen you do a lot of Zigaboo as well. You big Zig yeah. guys? Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. I love the meters. And uh yeah, yeah, for sure. Stanton Moore, like you mentioned, he's a beast. Dude, so heavy. Such a heavy drummer. Um that's very cool, man. Okay, so we've went through a little bit of your history. Uh what should we expect from from Jeff Randall next? Like what what are the things that you're currently striving for? And maybe let us in, be really real with even your own struggle as a, as a you mentioned the word earlier. I don't know if this was before the interview or once we started, but you talked about being hungry, right? What's it like? How do you balance expectations? Man, that's such a good question. Yeah, I mean, to be really open with, you know, you and uh, your audience, I guess I, after going to UNT, I went out into Dallas. I gigged in Texas for a few years. You know, I did wedding gigs. I did some original stuff, which is really cool. Um, you know, I've, I've gone and toured with artists like Luke Wade, um, who's on The Voice, a guy named Ray Johnston, who's a country artist in Texas. Um, so I've done that. I played full time for a while out in Texas, but I kind of came to the realization that the gigging I was doing, namely the local gigs, the wedding gigs, right? And these kind of one-off gigs, yeah. not going to give me any kind of longevity in the music business. You know what I mean? They it's were good that you saw that, man. Um, I just had a buddy the other day, we were talking about that, where he feels like he just spent two years kind of wasting it playing with just a wedding band, you know? Yeah. And it's nice, right? Because you can get, you can make, I could make in a wedding band what I make working at Apple, you know, in one gig, yeah. right? But you do kind of, I would say, sell your soul a little bit, um, and you can let a long time pass yeah. and not realize you're kind of, you're not really a professional musician. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I guess, I guess you are, but I, I would consider a pro musician or the one I hope to be playing with artists, yeah. right? You know, yeah. some original stuff um, or teaching, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, just to say. I left Texas. I needed a change. So I moved out to Nashville almost two years ago now. And I got a real job. I work at Apple. So I can say no to these kind of gigs we're talking about. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm kind of actively um, posting things on Instagram, all my kind of social media stuff as a means of networking and um, finding that artist gig. You know, I would hope, you know, you asked what my future plans are. I would love to pick up an artist gig or some kind of opportunity like that and just get out and travel. I love traveling. You What's know? your dream gig, man? If you could get any artist, who would it be? <laughs> um, I'd love to play with Gary Clark Jr. I'd love to play. Oh, with, cool. Yeah, man. I mean, that's uh, speaking of JJ, you know, JJ Johnson recorded his whole first album, that Gary right. album. I forgot. Well, JJ's out with the, is it the. Um, Oh, shoot. Tedeschi trucks. trucks. Tedeschi Trucks. There you go. Yeah. Um, which is awesome because th there's a double drummer on that gig, which is the coolest thing in the world. That's so, right. Okay, cool, man. So you go with Gary Clark. Who else? I mean, my uh, top of the mountain, John Mayer, dude. John yeah. Mayer. <laughs> <laughs> dude, I don't think Aaron Sterling is going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I couldn't, you know, couldn't hope to take his place. Um, I yeah. love Aaron's playing, man. Um but yeah, I mean, I've always had kind of like a, John Mayer's always been just an inspirational guy. I just, I, I feel like I see a lot in him. 
um, that I relate to, you know, kind of just, I feel like he had quote unquote, a normal kind of upbringing, but mm. he really wanted to do it and he made it happen, you know, and I have a lot of yeah. respect for the guy, you know? Yeah. It's funny, man. I'm a huge John Mayer fan. It's so dorky. I feel like as, as this podcast goes on and grows, people are probably going to get sick of me talking about my influences, you know, and being someone to John Mayer, but it really inspired me. And, and for me, kind of the turning point was like, I like John Mayer's music. And it was around the time that the Battle Studies record came out where I started to find myself more and more uh, just like into that vibe, maturing as a musician, beginning to get what, you know, what these guys were saying musically. And then I went and saw John Mayer play and I had this crazy privilege. Like at the time, I would do anything now to have this opportunity back. But I got to walk the stage because the guy that was doing John Mayer's in-ears, um, you know, it was a friend of mine, invited me out to the gig, and it was at this uh, venue called the Molson Amphitheater in Toronto, and I got to walk the stage, I got to, you know, check out all his guitars that he used on, like, Live in LA, all these videos that I'd seen and been really into, and at the time, Keith Carlock was drumming with him, so I got to go behind Keith's kit and check it out, and uh, afterwards, I got to meet Keith, I got to meet David Ryan Harris, I didn't get to meet John, but, you know, I got to meet all these guys, and that experience of, of walking that stage and then watching the performance that night was like the most inspiring moment for me as a musician and even as a person. It was just a really inspiring moment to be uh, mm-hmm. so moved because, yeah, you're right. He's He's got this really authentic thing about himself and at the time he had super long hair and he's wearing the bandana. He was kind of trying to pull off like the Hendrix look <laughs> Yeah, and it just couldn't have been any cooler, you know? Yeah. Couldn't have been any cooler. Yeah, man. Uh, I, I appreciate his – honesty you know i you know yeah. a lot of people when you mention john mayer he's kind of a love him or hate him kind of guy i feel totally. like kind of a divisive yeah. figure in music but for me man i just feel like he is he is our generation's eric clapton you know if you if you had yeah. to put it to that right you know and i think he's done so much for music that if you don't if you're not hearing what he's bringing to music i just don't know what you're <laughs> Which you know what I mean? I totally agree, man. I absolutely agree. And his latest two records, even though they've been less, it's funny, man. When people say Continuum's their favorite record, a part of me is like, I get that. But these last two records for me, Born and Raised and now Paradise Valley, Valley, were the records that just they spoke to me so much. I would say that those records will forever be the records that I've listened to more than anything else. Because probably over the last four or five years since they've been out, I don't even know if it's been that long. Um, three or four years, I have not stopped playing them. They're like go-to records almost all the time. You know, once a week I'm listening to songs off that off those records, even after all this time. So yeah, man, it's like you guys got to check that out. You got to get hip to that. The groove in Paper Doll alone is just phenomenal. Oh yeah, man. Uh, yeah, as drummers, it, all those albums are gold. Yes. You know, yeah. everyone's albums are. You you could probably spend your entire career practicing John Mayer albums. You'd be a okay, you know. If totally. you're a drummer, um, yeah, I, I agree though. With the last couple albums, though, man, they kind of took a step back from, I guess, you know, the more aggressive approach. But the lyrical content, the kind of the life lessons you can learn listening to that record, yeah, or those records, you know, they're all there. It's pretty yeah. Cool. Oh man, that's exactly it. It's just it hasn't stopped speaking to me, and it's funny because. You know, I grew up in a great home. I think of like, if my life was a song, it would probably be American Privilege by Alan Stone because it's just like, I am so privileged, right? I have all these great things and for me, I've really had to disconnect myself from how great of an upbringing I had. But I think of someone like, you know, you think of John Mayer and I don't know enough about his life. I just know that his parents were divorced and uh, I can imagine that all that fame early, he talks about being a little bit of an egomaniac in his early years, just like it messed him up, right? And there's there's a lot of like, you see John Mayer seeking validation in things. He talks about like, in the Live in LA DVD, there's a moment where he talks about, you know, going through a phase of buying a lot of things and then getting in and out of that a few times and going, I don't really like that. And like, then, you know, um, trying to find it in women, right? See such a big phase there. And I think it's cool that he's finding himself more and more musically. I think that that's really special. But the, you're right. The lyrical content is just, it, it's like so emotional to me every time I listen to those songs. Like the Born and Raised, um, not the reprise, but the first one on the Born and Raised record, that song is just phenomenal. Yep. Absolutely, phenomenal. man. 
I totally right. agree. Enough John Merrick. We gotta get off of it. We gotta get off of it. <laughs> well, I do actually. One one really cool story that I have before we exit that is uh, I bought a snare off Aaron Sterling um, maybe a year and a half ago. I bought this like fifteen by eight Lady Ludwig snare uh, out of his collection, and a year later, you know, I get this this Twitter message. I actually got an email on my phone that said Aaron Sterling has has uh, messaged you right. And I was like, Aaron Stur- like, what the heck? This has got to be like a mistake. Like he's got some virus or something. And I went on and he's like, hey man, he's like, I sold you a snare about a year ago. And he goes, I didn't realize that it belonged to a friend. And I've actually, you know, like you don't have to give it back, but it'd be great if you would. And he's like, I can either refund you your money or I can send you another drum. So I was like, what other drums he got, man? I'm totally into <laughs> another drum. I really only bought the drum because I really admired what he was doing, right? And he told me some story about using that snare drum in some rehearsals with John Mayer, and I was like, I want it, right? Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, so he, he, you know, I'm like, what other drums you got? And he goes, oh, man, well, I have, you know, I have this 14 by 6 and a half Slingerland. It's just like an old drum. He goes, but it's actually the drum that I used on Shadow Days with John Mayer. So I was like, yeah, yeah, that's the one. Send that right <laughs> now, you know? Whether or not yeah. it's true, I'm really giving him the benefit of the doubt. He seems like a super real dude. But, oh, yeah. uh, and he goes, I'll even throw in a, a pair of extra hi-hats. So I'm like, ah, oh, sick. There'll be some, probably some like Istanbul hi-hats or something. And I <laughs> got them. And it's really funny because this just shows you the type of guy Aaron Sterling is from the, like in terms of his sound. I get this pair of like 13-inch hi-hats with the snare drum that I looked up online and they're worth like $30. They're like a pair of like dinky, cheesy, cheap hi-hats. But he uses that kind of stuff because it's just about the sound, right? It's yeah. like, and they sound super dark and weird and washy, but it's like, that's the way Aaron, Aaron Sterling picks drums. I thought that was so special, you know? Absolutely. So. I used to think he was, uh, I guess when I first listened to him, I thought he'd be kind of a gearhead and really into that kind of stuff because I always see him swapping snares and all that, right? Yeah. But, I heard him say in an interview that he really is not attached to his right. equipment. It is just tools for him. Yeah. Have you ever seen that video with him playing on the uh, ironing board with the crash cymbals yes. on top? Of it? Oh, <laughs> amazing. That's pretty wild. Amazing. I'm really excited. Actually, there in Nashville where you are, he's been working quite heavily with uh, Paul Mabry and Dustin Burnett to produce what is that sound.com. They have a bunch of, uh, they essentially create drum library samples. I know they've been working with a whole bunch of heavy dudes, but I'm really excited to hear his samples and check that out. Um, another cool story with Aaron Sterling, I guess we can kind of go into depth with this because now we're just talking drums, but the kit that he used on the last John Mayer tour was a kit that he got from Matt Chamberlain, I believe. And I think that it was one that Matt Chamberlain bought in some, he bought it for like $70, like this whole drum kit. It's just some cheap, no name brand drum set that's like old and beat up and tattered. But these guys just rave, like Aaron Sterling and Matt Chamberlain rave about this $70 drum set that, you know, it doesn't have any real value, but it just sounds so good. That's like perfectly describes these guys, you know? Absolutely. You're right. They're like the anti gearhead, you know? Absolutely, man. So, cool. And if anybody knows, it's those kind of guys, those kind of studio guys. I mean, talk about an ideal gig, having yeah. a studio gig like that, oh, a session, session gig. I think that's really where yeah. it's at. So I, I definitely would love to tour, do all that stuff for a while, but I can definitely see later on, you'd probably get pretty burnt out doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those guys are pretty awesome. Think about the competition, man. If you're going up against those guys if you want to do session playing. Those guys are so crazy. If you guys don't follow Paul Mayberry on Instagram, you got to go do that. Yeah, uh, for sure. Mabes is the real deal, man. He's the real deal. Absolutely. Uh, okay, cool, man. Well, let's see. What else do I want to kind of pick your brain about? It's funny because we're doing this spur of the moment, but I think that you've got great insight. And what I think is so cool about having you on the show here is that you're striving. You're in the middle of it. And I think that you're doing a really great job. And I think that you're a great drummer. And I also think it's only a matter of time for you before you land something. And then we're having to like fly you to 180 or figure that out, which I already want to have you in at 180. It's just connecting, (laughs) just finding the right time to do that. But, uh, but yeah, man. So we've gone through some of your, you know, your past history playing drums. What is it presently that's inspiring you the most to play drums? Man, to, uh, well, if I'm being honest, to not have a real job, I, uh, I think, you know, 
I think you have to have a very specialized skill these days to really compete. And I've my whole life played drums, man. I just feel a calling for it. So I do feel like uh, I th- we were talking, you know, off mic or whatever before we started this, just about the older I get, the hungrier I get to make it happen, hmm. you know. And um, there's this great book. It's called um, The War of Art. That oh, um, yeah. is it. Pressfield is that the guy's name? You know Steve what? I, I can't remember. I honestly can't remember. I, I actually haven't read this book. Disclaimer. But uh, it is just talked about everywhere. It is so good, man. I think it is Stephen Pressfield. I hope I'm not me- uh, messing that up. But it just talks about, um, and I'm not very familiar with uh, Pressfield, if this is the author, but he talks about his career and the fact that he didn't have a book that was successful until he was in his 40s. You know, And he wow. had a lot of dark times you know, and a lot of things like that. And you know, definitely go pick that book up if you guys are – um, needing inspiration. Um, that one has definitely been really good for me. A real short one too, real sweet one. Um, but really, yeah, man, for me, it's just making it happen. I'm just, I'm hungry to do it. And I feel like more and more I am spending my time doing things that are super fulfilling. Whenever I post a video, those videos I post feel way better than going and playing a local gig for 15 people or maybe a hundred people that are really drunk. You know what I mean? It's just, yes. I just feel like there's way more, um, you know, longevity in posting great content out there and, uh, really, uh, seeing what other people are doing out on the internet. It's a whole, it's a wild west out there now, man. Yeah. It's so different than it was five years ago. Well, it's you funny. Know? You're, you're absolutely right. And it's, it's a wild west because not only is everybody doing it, but how good you are doesn't seem to matter. There's like this irony where I see some drummers out there and I would never name names, but they're getting more and more popularity online. And in some ways I'm like, this guy's a pretty, like he's not a great drummer. He, if we were to sit in a room and see him with a band, he would probably fumble and it wouldn't work out well, but his video production's great. And his ability to just kind of like unashamedly market himself and just like pump himself out there. Like I'm not referring to one individual. I mean, I see this a bunch and I'm also not criticizing that because I think in doing that, you're going to get better and you're going to learn. Right. But you see this where you see drummers that definitely don't hit the mark in terms of being great drummers, but they're like marketing themselves and doing a great job at it and using all the other things that combine in. So video quality, audio quality, uh, marketing, those three things are, sometimes way more determining, you know, of your success than just your skill. So it's like such a crazy world right now, man. Absolutely, man. A lot of style comes into play too, you know, what yeah. being perceived as like, this guy is cool. He sounds right. better for some reason, or this guy kind of looks kind of normal. looks kind of, it's yeah. kind of like when I see a band, that's one thing I have to work on a lot with myself is you go out and see an artist and his band is killing, but you know, maybe uh, the bass player the bass player is wearing just a normal kind of getup. He kind of looks like he just got out of class or something, and he's just not bringing the attitude on the on the looks front, which is yeah. kind of say. But because I struggle with that, I like to just wear whatever, right? But there is definitely a sound that comes across in how you look when you play. And, yeah, you know, it's interesting, man. I I totally know what you're saying when someone doesn't necessarily have the the skills that other people out there do, but they have that vibe. They have the look in their video or something that uh, is kind of magic, you know? Yeah, it's crazy, man. Okay. That's really cool to get your, your kind of your perspective on that because, yeah, it's uh, that's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. It's pretty crazy. I mean, this is a big conversation in life. Forget drums. The conversation of talent, you know, versus opportunity versus, uh, you know, raw talent. I mean, there's so many ways of looking at this, but... Let's get into gear a little bit with you. I saw that just recently you got a really sweet looking set of 16 inch hi hats that you probably spent way too much money on. <laughs> well, yeah, man. And I, I picked up some 16, uh, 16 inch Zildjian K light hats uh, from this local shop in Nashville called Forks Drum Closet, which is like the, it's the shop in Nashville. Woo. But uh, honestly, man, I took them back, tried them out. They felt a little small. You know, a little bit too small. So I so went, I, I was driving these guys nuts, man. I was uh, in their cymbal vault um, trying out tons of combinations. And um, I had just been using for a long time um, this uh, pair of crashes I had, these 19-inch 
Zildjian K lights. So I got really used to that. I went on tour with those and it started to feel so normal, man, that I bought these 16s and they just felt small. So anyway, I ended up with a pair of uh, 18 inch um, hats. The top is a Zildjian K Constantinople and the bottom is a Zildjian A crash ride which I believe is pretty much the same setup as the Killers drummer. Um, Ronnie Venucci. Cool, there you man. Go. Very yeah. cool. Kind of landed on that, man. But yeah, um, I really dig I really dig the Zildjians, the K-Lights, the Constantinopoles um, on the cymbal front. Cool. And then uh, what are your other cymbals? What else do you have? I have um, pretty much that's what I'm using now. I have a 24-inch K-Light ride that's been my baby for a few years now. Um, you know, JJ Johnson, right. I, I'm just ripping everybody off, man. That's uh, great. It's great. <laughs> um, but it's an amazing ride. Um, and yeah, uh, for my crashes, I have a 20 inch K Constantinople on the left, a 22 inch K Constantinople thin low on the right, those hats. And sometimes I'll use like a crash of doom, 21 inch, nice. or even a stack of two crashes of dooms. I really dig the bigger kind so of So much stuff. doom. So much crashing of doom. Too much doom. <laughs> uh, okay, and you're using the Steve Jordan snare. Why wouldn't you be? Sure. Yeah, I got that. <laughs> got a few snares. Yeah. Yeah, you do. What else do you got? Well, I have that Steve Jordan. Um, I have the one I've been using mostly right now. It's a 14 by 8 Gretsch maple snare. So it's really, really deep, but you're able to crank it and still have a lot of body. You know, because I do like that crack sound, but uh, I want it to be real full. You know, yeah. I want it to be thin. So I use that a lot. And um, what else? I got some cheap snares too. I have this old school Slingerland snare I got for eighty bucks. It's vintage. It's just a dumpy sounding snare. You know that thud snare. Yeah. And, um, inexpensive Yamaha piccolo brass snare. You guys could pick up for a hundred bucks. That thing's nice. awesome. And uh, yeah, stuff stuff like that, but. My main go-to is that Gretsch right now, man. Cool. So now, remind me if I forget. I want to ask you about tuning. We'll talk about tuning snares. We'll talk about tuning drums. But uh, And what about for your kit? Right now, you're using a Yamaha Maple Custom Absolute Kit? That's it, yeah. Okay. And like 12, are you using a 22, 16? Yeah, right now. I have a... I on, where's have... your 24, Jeff? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm wondering. <laughs> 20, a 24 by 14 would be awesome, man. Really old school size. Nice. That's what I I've would, got. I do have that on, on a Gretsch kit downstairs that I use, and it's. Uh, I just gave away that I'm. I'm in an upstairs. I am in an upstairs sitting right now, people. But downstairs, I've got a Gretsch, an 80s Gretsch kit that I use that I just love. It's 12, 13, 16, 18, 24 by 14, and I'll swap out those sizes. But that was like the shell bank for me of drums that I really always wanted, and it's just beat up like black nitron finish um there's like loose parts on the drums that i have to fix all the time they're they're perfect that's so awesome. i guess i'm just rubbing it in your face man i'm sorry <laughs> yeah, I mean, one day i'll be as cool and i'll have one now that's such a killer size because you can yeah you can crank it you still get a lot of body and it. it's real responsive because it's not so deep you yes know? yeah so, no i have a it's just a standard 22 by 16 inch kick i have a 13 by uh, Gosh, that's like 13 by 12, 13 by 10. What is it? I don't know. Nine, probably by nine. There you go. There you yeah. go. 13 by nine, 14 by 14 floor, 16 by 16 floor. Cool. That's what I'm doing right now. Um, Very cool. You know, usually I'll do two floors. Um, but uh, yeah, man. And I have the same like shells in smaller sizes too. I have like an 18 by 16 kick. So I can go off and play those, uh, Great. those lighter gigs, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I just sold the kit. Uh, probably a year ago now, that was the same thing. I had a Yamaha Maple Custom Absolute kit, but I, I hated the fade that I had. Your kit looks nice. I had like the candy apple fade, which is just terrible. It's like, it looks like, uh, how would I describe it? It looks like fall, you know, apple and corn colored drums. Just terrible. It's like this red fade to a really light yellow sparkle. But the problem is that because it's such a big fade, some of the, like, the, none of the drums look the same. They all look completely different because Yamaha hand, hand lays these fades. So I would look at them in the light and it's just like it looks horrible for me. 
But uh, but in terms of the sound of those drums, they're amazing. And I had like 8, 10, 12, 15, or 8, 10, 12, yeah, 8, 10, 12, 15, 16, which is super weird. And then a 22 and a 14 by five and a half snare to go with it. So, dude, I dig the Yamaha thing, man. I mean, we use that at 180 a ton. We use the Phoenix kits. They just sound awesome. I do too, man. Real simple, which is what I like yeah. about it. Simple hardware, which I dig. Keep it yeah. real simple. I think I used to have a sonar kit and those are amazing kits, but gosh, they got hardware for days on those. No like kidding. Heavy drums, they just load them down. Yeah. But can't speak bad, badly about them. I just kind of like the, uh, yeah. more vintage approach of just, you know, regular lugs. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, um, man. Okay, cool. So that's, that, those are your drums. Now talk us through tuning, man. How do you approach it? You've been using CS dots a bunch. Yeah, I've been using those. I'm probably going to depart from those. That was kind of a, I wanted to try them because I never used them, but those are awesome if you guys want to get a warmth, but also some good attack, some nice open attack. Um, that's what I've been using. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as tuning, um, gosh, you know, it's really simple. I put pressure in the center of the head, get rid of all the wrinkles first, right? And then, uh, I'll just get the uh, pitch the same at each and every lug. Um, I'll do that for both sides, and I'll put the resonant side slightly higher than the batter side, typically. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? I yeah. think that's a good way to do it. That's great. For all those of you who, which is all of you except for me, they can't see Jeff right now. He was giving me such a look of like, man, tuning, you're putting me on the spot. I mean, it's tuning. <laughs> so perfect, man. Yeah, that's great. It, it's it's funny, man. I always go back and forth with the tuning thing. We get asked that question a lot. The tough part about tuning is that it's really difficult to teach because it's such a feel thing. And it's such yes. a... I actually think that there's some great products out there for tuning. We use drum dial all the time at 180 because we don't have time to mess around when we've got, when we've got a guy coming in and we've got to get his drums ready. We don't have time to mess around and like take guess, you know, a lot of guesses at the sound and uh, we find that something like a drum dial, I mean, they're not paying us to say this. They sent us a drum dial to try it, but it's funny because it works really well. We haven't got into like TuneBot or any of these other ones, but what makes sense about the drum dial is that it's just testing that, that tension of the actual head on the on the uh, the shell there, right? So you get a very true interpretation, but... Um, yeah, tuning is a funny thing, man. Do you aim for a low fat sound? What are you going for in terms of tuning? Are you tuning your toms high? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think each kit is different in how you have to tune it. Um, so it really does depend, honestly, and it depends on my mood, right? I mean, the vibe you're going for. Yeah. Uh, I think that um, typically I dig now big drums pitched a little higher, you know, so they're very responsive. Um, they're very wide open, um, and they're still warm because you got these big old drums, you know? Um, so I tend to dig that these days. Cool. That's very Bonham-esque. Yeah. Yeah, it works, you know? It's a nice classic sound. Yeah. And then what are you using for, do you have a go-to snare batter? Yeah. I mean, I have, on the big Gretsch, I have a coded controlled sound where the dot's underneath, Cool. Right. So that's what I've been using with that. And that's actually really nice. Um, it's the first time I ever used that. Um, and I think I'm going to stick with that one. But yeah, I'll use uh, Coded Emperors on smaller snares. Uh, an Ambassador, if I'm trying to get uh, maybe a, you know, more responsive, uh, more response from the snare and yeah. stuff like that. A little snarier. Um, <laughs> t- typical stuff, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then for hardware, what do you use for a kick pedal? I use either the 9000, the DW9000, or 5000. Right now, I'm using the 9. But yeah. that's one of those, man, that's one of those areas I'm working on is my kick drum. Because for my the first half of my drumming career, I was a heel down player. Oh, wow. And I would let the beater, you know, come off, right? Right. And it wasn't until later that I started going heel up and keeping it dug yeah. in. And still to this day, I'm still working out. Yeah. the intricacies of that with independence and stuff, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So I go back and forth because the nine and the five are very different feels on those pedals, you know? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. A lot of guys prefer the five because they like to fight with their pedal. Um, personally, I haven't used the five enough to even have an opinion on the DW5000, but I have a, I have the 9000 and I really, really enjoy it. I love it. I think it's a great pedal. 
Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat, man. I've spent a lot of time on foot technique, like a lot of time just sitting there. I had practice sessions for four hours where I'd sit there just being psychotic about my foot, you know, so interested in trying to mess with different techniques. You see these videos of guys like Jojo Mayer who are just freaks. And we've got a guy in Toronto. I don't even know if you know who he is, Jeff. Have you heard of Larnell Lewis? I have heard of Larnell. Dude, yes. He's, he's been blowing up. Yeah, he's with Snarky. Right. So people are becoming really familiar with him. But it's funny because Larnell has been popular in Toronto, in my mind, for the last five years. But it's just like in the last year that he did the Snarky Puppy record. And he's been getting the attention that I think he deserves. Because he's... He's honestly one of the best drummers on the planet. He's uh, also an amazing keyboard player and a phenomenal bass player. Like, he is a musician. He gets it, you know? Yeah. So he has this amazing approach to playing. Like, if you guys haven't checked out Snarky Puppy's latest record, uh, is it called What About Us? What About Me? Mm, oh, I have shoot. To Do your homework, Jake. <laughs> um Check and out all their stuff. Check out all their stuff. Check out that latest record, though. I think the song is called uh, What About Me or What About Us. Just Snarky Puppy, What About, and then let it let it fill it in for you because technology is amazing. And uh, go check that video out and listen to Larnell Lewis's drum solo. It's live off the floor that they do this track. It's just the greatest piece of music you've ever heard. It's phenomenal. Um, but cool, man. Okay, so we've talked tuning. We've talked you know, a ton of different things. What is it that you, what are some things you want to share when you look at the drum world right now or the things you think are missing? Talk to me. Yeah, we were talking about this um, a little earlier. I would say that from an educational standpoint, I would love to see, um, I'd love to see more perspective on the drummers when they come into these, you know, to 180 drums, yeah. when they come to all these, you know, sites that we're now following, I'd love to hear about, like you asked me, my daily routine. I think that's such good information to hear, like what Larnell's daily routine is and yeah. what he, you know, in practicality actually does when he goes into the practice room and kind of what his mindset is. Does he set one goal when he goes in there? Right. Um, he has to accomplish does he noodle like what's his framework for his practice sessions and things like that um to focus more on like i was telling you focusing more on the the how and the why than really the what these right. drummers are playing because yeah. we tend to we we break things down in terms of this chop you know this is kick left right right left kick you know what i mean and that's yeah. great right i mean that's definitely cool and there uh, there's a place for that but for me what has always been, I think, the reason I've gotten better over time has been just studying what these drummers do, like really paying attention to how is Steve Jordan, how is J.J. Johnson getting that feel, like watching them and trying to get in their frame of mind. Yeah. And I'll share something with you guys. I think like one of the big secrets to Steve Jordan and J.J. and these kind of dudes, one of the secrets to their feels is – the constant range of motion they have with each limb. Like each limb, if you think about, you know, you have four limbs, you think about them like kind of a clock with four different dials all meshing, you know. Mm -hmm. They're all smoothly kind of in these cogs and they're meshing together. It's very important that when you're playing a groove, no matter how complex or how simple, that each limb has its own very steady motion, you know, like – if I'm just playing boom, bop, boom, bop, my right hand that's playing eighth notes, I need to either be rebounding on the hi-hat, letting the stick do the work, or I need to have a very steady, you know, arm motion, right? Yeah. You, know, you guys can't see what I'm doing, but, you know, there's a motion that I see that JJ and Steve do when they play time on, a ha on hi-hats or a ride. Yeah. Yeah. It's very constant, and their left foot's synced with it, their kick's synced with it. It's just, it's all flowing. And I think that's a real secret that um, takes real patience to develop, and it's the reason they have such a deep feel. It's their cogs, man, are so deep, and they'll change to a swing feel. The cogs change shape, but they're still flowing together. You know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. For anyone who's going, Jeff, what's a cog? <laughs> <laughs> I guess, like, think of Back to the Future. We just celebrated that Back to the Future day. You know, all those gears in a watch that are kind of, um, you know, meshing together to turn that dial. That's how I'm kind of imagining it. 
Yeah, um, that's great, man. Does that help? It, you're absolutely right, man. When I watch these guys, it's funny. There's a, there's a consistency. Maybe to, to take it really far to encourage you guys to get into what Jeff's saying, take a guy like Stuart Copeland and just type his name in on YouTube right now if you're listening to this and look at how how he looks when he plays drums. Like turn off the volume and then turn it on and see if that sound doesn't perfectly replicate the way he looks. And then type in the name Daru Jones and look at this guy because he is like one of the most unique feeling drummers. And type in something like look for a, a video clip of Daru where he's like in the studio or he's doing a hip hop thing and watch how bouncy his body is and then listen to the sound that that creates, you know? And then look at a, look up a guy like Garrett Goodwin, right? And then look at how relaxed he looks when he's playing and how that sound is really laid back. Uh, you're totally right, man. Like when I look at Steve Jordan and when I look at JJ, they both play the hi-hat somewhat similarly. Like there's this real swagger about the way they play and it perfectly, you know, translates into the sound. Dude, that's a great point. And you're, I love how you're, you know, different strokes for different folks. This drummer has this kind of feel because he's got this range of motion going on with his yeah. body this way. Cause there, you're right. There's no right way. There's no like everyone play with this pocket, right? That's yeah. silly. So no, that's a great point, man. Thanks for saying that. Cause that's something for me to think about too. Dude, I'm, it's, yeah. It's, I'm addicted to getting that feel down. Right. But I got to keep in perspective the yes. fact let's be open to all these feels. For sure. Amazing. And it's funny, man. Like, you're right. I think that it's cool. It's cool that you're zeroing in on something for yourself because no matter what, you, you're never going to sound just like JJ. And you're never going to sound just like Steve Jordan, right? You're always going to kind of have your own thing. So I think it's fine to really pick a couple guys and dig into it. I went for, I really explored Keith Carlock early on. And I don't think I sound anything like that because I got, I just kind of took elements of what he did and then got carried away with other stuff, you know? But, um, uh, we were talking about drummers. Who was another guy that I wanted to mention? Oh, man. When Stanley Randolph was in at 180 Drums. I mean, if you guys don't know who Stanley Randolph is, you're just missing out. And if you're listening to this and you don't know who he is, I'm confused because he's uh, definitely one of, you know, one of, one of the amazing instructors we've had at 180. And he talks, dude, in the Superstition video, I believe it is, that we filmed within the lesson. He talks about uh, Stevie Wonder. And how when Stevie sat down at his kit and played drums, which, I mean, think about the honor that that is to have Stevie sit down at your drum set and play. He said that the first thing he noticed about Stevie was that because he couldn't see, he had a little bit of this, this tendency to, he just played the drums unlike anyone that Stanley had ever watched play the drums. Because, I mean, Stevie is the one recording drums for Superstition, right? Like, Stevie is the drummer on a lot of this stuff. And yeah. if that doesn't mess up your brain, then then you're weird. Because, I mean, think about that. That's, that is so crazy that he's such a great drummer as well. And what's so cool is that Stanley actually told me that he intentionally fumbles with his sticks on some of these songs to make it sound raw and to make it sound sloppy and gritty, but cool. And I was, like, just so blown away by that. So, you know, Stanley Randolph grew up marching. So he has amazing technique and he uses really, really big marching style drumsticks when he plays the kit. He uses a, a Vic Firth metal, uh, metal, he uses the metal stick, <laughs> which is like a 2B extended. It's, it's crazy. Wow. It's like Garrett Goodwin's stick, man. It's next level. But uh, he plays like that and then to add to it, he's intentionally making his hands feel kind of loose and stupid and like sloppy, but keeping track of them, but just letting them get away from him at times and then he's doing all these things to help create a feel. So he is a drummer who's an amazing drummer, but he had Stevie Wonder sit at his kit, and then he adjusted his feel to try and mimic that vibe. So, like, dude, you know, I think it's awesome that you're doing it, and to encourage that, it's like guys like Stanley Randolph are doing that. You know, everyone that's a really, really great drummer is trying to sink into into what other guys are doing. You know, absolutely, man. I just always want to play a definitive beat, I think. It's mm. very important, I think, to really, I don't know, bring a vibe across whenever you're playing as a drummer because you're setting the tone. And yeah. that is so cool to hear that about Stanley doing that because those Stevie Wonder beats, I mean, those are those are definitive grooves that are very hard to replicate because Stevie is such an unorthodox drummer. You know what I mean? So unorthodox. And to, to talk about how he holds the stick, I mean, we talk about this in the lesson, but I'll give it away a little bit right now is that 
It's essentially like if you took the stick, and I'm showing Jeff this, so you guys are just going to have to deal with my verbal description. Maybe we'll take a picture and put it up if you want it, ask for it. But he, <laughs> he holds the stick like the number one way I tell every student not to hold the stick, ironic enough, is he puts his pointer finger, his index finger, along the stick, and when he plays, he uses this real like pressing his index finger in sound, and he plays way up on the hi-hat to the point where like the shaft of the stick is almost along the bell. So it's like this really unorthodox way of playing the hi-hat, but that motion, it's like when you go to play, naturally it swings a little bit because it's a weird, like a weird motion gesture with your hand, and then that, that swing, if you emphasize it or try and straighten it out, no matter what, it sounds kind of gritty and dirty, and that's a huge part of Stevie's sound is that he's holding the sticks re real whacked, you know, like... The number one way, I, like I said, the number one way I tell someone not to hold a stick, that is actually the thing that has helped him create a sound. So, mm. man, you got to break some rules, you know? Dude, absolutely. And this is one thing I've been thinking about a lot. It's like these guys that have these styles, and we associate a style with each of these guys we're talking about, these yeah. pros there. I feel like I'm always evolving as a drummer. I'm always continually, you know, getting into phases and out of phases. And I'm jealous of, you know, dudes that get signed on with an artist and they're able to cultivate a style with that artist. I think that's kind of yeah. where it's coming from, right? I mean, you get, you get a gig and you play for five years, 10 years with this artist and boom, there's your style because night after night, you're going in depth with that style every night. You know what I mean? It's and impossible I, to replicate truly. Yeah. Like, you know, Stanley Randolph would not be the drummer he is today if he hadn't spent eight years on the road with Stevie Wonder. I could not agree more, you know? Yeah. It's kind of key, I think, you know? And I don't think uh, you're able to really know who you are as a as a musician until you really put years behind that style, you wow. know? At least speaking for myself, because yeah. I can really change, you know? Dude, I think that's a great point. I mean, one of the other founders of 180 Drums, my business partner with 180 is, and one of my best friends is Steve Augustine, and he plays with Thousand Foot Crutch, but it's been his band for the last, I want to say close to 20 years or over 20 years. So you think about that, right? He's had the privilege of zeroing in on one sound and going, how can I, you know, what do I want my drums to sound like? What do I want my image to be? And all that stuff live. Not that Steve sits there and thinks about his image because he's in the exact opposite of that, funny enough. But it's <laughs> like, you know, what is the vibe that I want to set? And then you, like you just said, you spend a long time, little by little, zeroing in on it and refining it. Then changing an aspect of it, then refining it. Then zeroing in a little bit farther, then refining it. And it's uh, it's something that, yeah, I guess to, to pass that on as tangible information to you guys, it's... You know, look at who inspires you the most right now and then just take one simple step in that direction. So decide like if you're really into John Bonham, well maybe the, one of the best steps you could take with John Bonham that I found really helpful is look at and find out what John Bonham was influenced by because he was really influenced by Little Richard, right? Yeah. So go and listen to that music and go, where is John Bonham in this music and then what can I take away to try and copy that sound? That's huge, man. And if I could piggyback off that, I think another suggestion would be, you know, everyone, a lot of people talk about um, learning a bunch of different styles and, you know, especially if you're starting out. And I think that is totally, totally true. You have got to, you know, gain independence in a lot of different styles, gain a vocabulary in a lot of different ways. So you can just go out there and gig and be successful for sure. But I do see, at least speaking for myself, when I shift from today, I'm going to practice jazz today i'm going to practice you know progressive rock i'm not i'm not i'm kind of plateauing you know mm. i'm not actually going above and beyond my playing ability in any one genre because yeah. i'm just kind of middling out with all of them and i think the only way to really go above and beyond is kind of you got to kind of hone in on where you're going to come from and that and every day you're climbing to the top of that mountain you know yeah I couldn't agree more, man. Um, and this is something that I do. I've never, I've never said this, you know, so this is the first time you guys are maybe hearing me say this unless I end up saying it somewhere else in the meantime. But I don't ever play on a practice pad. And the reason I don't is because these days I have such little time to play drums that if I do have time to play drums, I take anything that I would do on a practice pad and I immediately move it to the drum set. Now, I do got to preface that by saying I spent a lot of time 
early on playing on a practice pad. And I'm not at all saying that I think you grow out of it and then you mature and you don't need to ever use one. I think that it's an amazing tool. But that's one area where I'm like, one of my limitations is time. So, you know, I have to sacrifice the idea of sitting on a practice pad. And it's funny because I found that as I've taken it to the drum set, part of the other thing that's ironic is a practice pad is like, it's kind of like the hitting zero on a scale. So it, it zeroes out your hands in a good way. But as soon as you take your hands and you hit, you move it between a snare drum and a rack tom, you better hit those drums differently. You better not hit them like they're both practice pads, right? right. So that's something even for me where I'm like, the time that I have, uh, if I want to work on a rudiment, I'm immediately going to take it to the drum set. I'm going to start on the snare and then I'm immediately going to begin moving it around the kit because, you know, time is of the essence and because I want to develop everything thinking how does this how does this move and flow between each drum on the kit? And I guess the the reason I'm saying that to add to what you're saying is that it's like, yeah, you want to be great at everything, but don't be the jack of all trades, master of nothing. That's the worst thing you could do unless you want to be a wedding band drummer. Then that's the perfect thing to do, right? That's but right. Uh, like Aaron Gillespie would never land a jazz gig. Like it would be, it just wouldn't work. And he knows that. And that's why he doesn't waste time playing jazz. Not that it would be time wasted, but for Aaron Gillespie, it would absolutely be time wasted because he's doing a thing and it's an amazing thing. And, you know, I dare anyone listening to this that doesn't think Aaron has a thing to go try and hit their drums as hard as him for <laughs> five minutes and not be out of breath because sitting beside that dude, like just the hardest hitting drummer, like it's, it's incomprehensible. You'd have to focus on hitting each drum as hard as you physically could, and then trying to make that feel even remotely good. It's gnarly. Next level. It's really cool watching him and Elon both play with Paramore and seeing their approach, you know, and how they're both awesome. You know, they're both totally different, but totally cool, you know. Yeah. Dude, Aaron, I, Aaron's really cool because he kind of plays straight through those songs. And uh, it's his own thing. Whereas Elon plays very much in and around them, but... That's what's so cool about Aaron, and I think Paramore is going to have a hard time, you know, if Aaron moves on from that band, they would have a hard time finding something that, like, it would be, it, you can't, like, no one's like Aaron. That's what's so cool, right, is that he's like a band member, you know? That's what it's all about, man. Yeah. I think that, you know, if I could ask you a question, okay, if you're going to go into the practice room, having said what we've said, are you, um, are you setting a goal at the outset, a particular four bar phrase, a particular thing, and then recording it to check that you've got it? Or how do you, how do you gauge your success, you know, when you're done practicing for the day, you know? Yeah, that's great, man. What I'm doing right now, what I usually do is I sit down at the drum set and, you know, it's like we kind of have some go-to things that we do. I'll usually start by just playing time, um, playing some type of time, and then just having some fun soloing right away just to get myself warm, to be moving around the kit to, you know, put my independence in check right away. So I'll usually keep time on the upbeats with my left foot. This is like real typical what I would go to. I go to like upbeats on the left foot and then I would begin comping some stuff, switching in and out of, you know, 16th notes and sextuplets and just warming up. And then what I do often right now is for the first half an hour, say, I'll do stuff like that and then I'll find a weakness. This is something that I teach all my students. It's like just play and then as soon as you uh, like, you know, go to move down the toms and you're like, oh, that felt weird. I'll just sit there and like press into that. You know, I'll go, I yeah. don't like that something that I wanted to do right away. I couldn't execute. So I'll just sit on that thing because it's something that I came up with that I thought about. Right. So that means I have ideas that I can't put down on the drum set. That's an issue in my mind. So that's where I put a lot of my time in terms of like, you know, and lately I've been taking a lot of like, okay, let's take sex tuplets in general and then let's add, you know, like I've been working on some stickings where you just go right, left, right, left, right, kick, right, left, right, left, right, kick, you know, she get a dig it, she get a dig it, and just moving that around the kit and getting comfortable with that and then going, what if I put the bass drum on the E, you know? So now it's kick, right, left, right, left, right, you know, and just going through it that way. So that's some stuff that I'm practicing on personally. And then immediately what I get into is I, I'm as soon as I'm starting to feel comfortable with an idea, like, oh, that thing that was uncomfortable, it's feeling a little bit better now. I take it, I isolate it. So say it's like, say it's that pattern, right, left, right, left, right, kick. 
I'll sit there, I'll play it just on the snare, I'll begin moving it around the kit, then I'll immediately go, okay, let's put it in a groove. I'll play a groove, and then I'll play a groove for a bar, play the fill for a bar. Then I'll eventually get to the place where I play the groove for a bar and a half, and the fill for half of a bar, you know? And experiment with it. What if I came in on this spot, whatever, and I'll just kind of like permutate everything, try some different ideas. I know I'm being a little bit wordy, but this is how I practice. I'll dig into something like that, and then immediately, as soon as it's feeling kind of comfy... Uh, I use like I actually use an app on my phone. Here's my little my little hack. I use an app on my phone called Easy Beats LE. Just Easy Beats LE, and all it does is it programs beats. So I'm actually opening it right now, and I can just plug in beats that I want to work on. Like I can program it on the fly. So so this is something I did for a student the other day. This is like a basic, really really basic pattern. But say I took that. And what you can do with this app that I love is I'll increase the tempo. So, and then I can hit the record button once it's going, and I can program a groove. So I'll go like, so I'll go, and I'll just add something else. And then I'll sit with something like that, you know, right away and yeah. then just be like, man, I want to dig in and like, maybe I'm going to put that, you know, the, maybe I'm going to try and solo and then make sure that every time I hear that clap that I'm able to right here, that I'm able to like incorporate that into my playing and then, you know, or I'll just let that play and then work on my idea, work on my sex tablet idea and be able to move that around with those opposing rhythms, you know? So yeah. that's something that I, I'm super into programming grooves right now. And that happened because when we had Stanley in, he talked about how he would use drum machines and just play along with them. And I've been really listening to like, where does my bass drum placement sit? Like, am I early on the kick? Or because I found that I'm early and that really makes me sound like, you know, maybe this is offensive to you, but it's totally honest. I felt like oh, I sound like a white guy. I just sound like a white drummer <laughs> when I put the bass, like it's I'm I'm rushing it, you know? So I am really kind of monitoring that, and then yeah, if you if you're recording yourself, that's such a useful tool. I learned so much about my playing recording more than 200 videos at 180. A lot of which we threw out because they were pilots early on, and then a lot of which became the 50 videos for the Fresh Sticks category, the the beginner category. And then you know, sitting in the room now with every drummer, I'm just learning. It's information overload, right? But yeah. I'll do that programming, and then lately what I've been doing is putting on dance tracks or electronic songs like um, Where Are You Now or something by, I think that's what it's called by Justin Bieber, because there's yeah. so many great remixes. And then just comping ideas over that, comping grooves over that, and trying to follow the accent patterns that are in the song, kind of like a motif, you know, whether it's with a groove or a fill. So I'm giving away all my secrets, guys, but <laughs> I have them. They thanks for asking. They're yours. Yeah, they're yours. <laughs> Um, but man, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm about guys getting better. So that's awesome. Take it, run with it. Please. We want all the secrets, man. And it sounds like you're really trying to put yourself into real world situations where yeah. you're, you're playing the fills, uh, after you've gotten the beat, which I think is really important. That's something that I kind of forget about. Sometimes I'll try to lock in on this groove so hard that I haven't played any fills. And when I try to play a fill, you know, it all crumbles, you know, that totally. foundation. You got to make sure you're able to depart from that flow and, and play a fill and get back to it. You know what I mean? Without losing the yeah, feel. I sure do, man. And, and I was in this instance, I was talking a lot about fills, but don't get me wrong. So like when I program those grooves, the reason I've been programming those grooves is because I spend most of my time trying to lock into those grooves and make it, make myself feel um, kind of like a robot because, because I think that when you listen to guys like Stanley it's funny, man. Like some of the grooviest stuff is done with drum machines. Like it just feels so cool and no human is going to perfectly replicate it. So you get this like really vibey Paul Mabry sound, right? Like Paul Mabry sounds like a drum machine. And Stanley Randolph, I actually took a video of him on my phone that is hilarious. I took a video of him just raving about Paul Mabry. And a lot of people don't know that. But Stanley's <laughs> a big Paul Mabry fan too. And he just found this guy on Instagram, you know? Yeah. So 
Yeah, man, that's kind of where I'm at with stuff. And to be honest, I'm trying to make sure, this is important, I think, for people to hear. I'm trying to make sure I do things that inspire me and that I have fun with. Because at the end of the day, if you're trying to learn all these things with drums and you're just learning it because you think it's what you should be doing, you're, you're probably not sounding great because your heart's not in it, you know? You're better off, honestly, you're better off working on just a ton of chops if it gets you practicing and if it's fun than trying to be something that you're not. You know, people might hate me for saying that, but the truth is, man, nowadays you can make a living being a Cooper drummer, you know, if that's your thing. You can just play along to other people's things and record that, or you can be a Luke Holland, right, Um, where you're orchestrating your own original parts over everything, and it's flashy, and it's busy, and it's awesome, you know? Um, I I think we're too quick to point the finger at how everything's wrong instead of just accepting that everything's different, and that's fine too, you know? Oh, so true. So true. Keep on preaching, man. There's one. There's just one. <laughs> there's just one comment that gets me every time when I when I post something. I'll know or forget when I post it. When anyone posts anything, you're gonna see this one comment for drumming. You're gonna see. Sounds good, man. But try it a little softer. You will have. Oh, that dude. Every time, which is such a. I get the intention, right? You want to be able. Yes, you want to be able to. You know, have control and play it softer for sure. But. All that person is doing is they're seeing that you've done something very well, and yep. they're trying to find that one thing that they can say to cut you down. Oh, you know? 100%, man. It drives me nuts, and I, and I say that it drives me nuts because I think that it's uh, – the irony is that if you go look at any of the YouTube channels where guys leave comments like this or whatever, they're usually bad drummers, and I hope that I'm saying that to discourage that kind of behavior because yeah. you know there's nothing wrong with encouraging someone. But like if you – first of all, no one necessarily asks you for your your encouragement and although it is a public setting and we're putting up videos and it's free reign, you know, you just got to think for yourself, man. How What would you be excited to see a comment, you know, from someone? Um, what would the thing that – what's the thing that you'd look for in a comment, right? And try and leave that for other people. If you want to encourage them, tell them how awesome, you know, their playing is and then maybe message them privately. If you really care, message them privately and say – Hey, dude, you sound awesome, man. You know, I noticed that this was something you're struggling with. Uh, you know, talk me through that. Can I help you with that? That is so personal that it'd be hard to find that offensive. And it's also not public. So yes. people that put up stuff like try it softer, what they're really saying is they're like, hey, world, this guy's pretty good, but I'm better than him. And it's subtle, but it's like this subtle, like, I know something more than you. And if it really, if you really do care so much, because some people might just right away bark back and be like, well, I really care about that drummer, then message them then message them one-on-one and I guarantee you they wouldn't do that, you know? So, uh, it, it drives me nuts because I saw how much it affected a guy like, you know, how much a guy like Luke got, got ripped on and Luke just couldn't be a better drummer. He's just so great, you know, and he's doing his thing. Right. And for people to say like, that guy's just a stick flip, flip drummer. I'm like, you're out of your mind. Like you're, you're (laughs) absolutely crazy. Right. Or yeah, even yeah. Aaron, even guys will dig into Aaron, uh, Aaron Gillespie, right? Guys will dig into him because he's so niche and it's like I get that it's not your thing but you try playing drums with Paramore and then you tell me how that goes, you know? Uh, because that is a gig that drummers have fallen over backwards on over and over again, you know, that you, that other drummers might think are great. So. Absolutely, dude. I, I just think that's human nature, man. You feel, for whatever reason, you feel threatened when you see someone do something that's impressing you and you just, it's subconscious. Of course you have to somehow take them down a peg. Yeah. You know, I've done it. I for sure. Um, and, but yeah, the older I get to realize, you know, the more I realize that that is what is going on here. This yeah. is very natural, but, and one thing I, I feel like it's forgotten all the time. It's like when you're seeing these guys like Aaron Gillespie go up and play with Paramore, you see any of these dudes, um, playing in front of thousands of people or in front of nobody, but cameras are on. So millions yeah. of Watching this, you're you're taking for granted the fact that that is a high pressure situation, and they're performing <laughs> under it. No, you kidding. know what I mean? Yep, no kidding. Like, it's easy to put out a video when you're by yourself, right? Can and you, you and you oh, shoot it ninety times? You know? Yes, dude, totally. You're you're looking for the one take, exactly. Yeah. But can you, you know, compete with guys like Aaron that go out there every night, play yeah. in front of thousands, and you're not fumbling? You know? Totally. Yeah, you got, man. Uh, Dude, totally. And, uh, and you know, at the end of the day, the other thing to remember is that no matter who your hero is as a drummer, they're all human, you know? Maybe some of them, like Vinny Cayuta, aren't human. But, uh, you know, the truth is, <laughs> man, it's like these guys are all humans. And 
that is what's so cool about music is that is that it's art and art is better when it's not perfect that's the whole point right so yeah. i actually find it fun when guys make mistakes you know and i'm not even referring to aaron anymore because i'm just saying in general when guys get up there and they do make mistakes in songs i think it's so cool man it's just character right it's like getting a nick in a leather jacket is the coolest thing that could happen to it you know absolutely that's my favorite kind of music right yeah. it's the that is authentic right you don't want to hear that polished beat mapped auto-tuned thing i mean may, may, sometimes maybe you do i don't know yeah. but really yeah. that raw stuff is yeah that's that that is home man that's one of the things going back yeah. to why I like john mayer dude he's okay showing you a little bit of humanity in that yeah. <laughs> stuff. absolutely and it's funny it. man absolutely i totally agree i think the coolest stuff is for me personally i think the coolest stuff is raw and organic but if you think the coolest stuff is polished and beat mapped and you know, fired from a laptop, guess what? I think that that's cool too, you know? Maybe that's not my number one go-to, but if that's your number one go-to, let's just agree to disagree in the best way possible, right? Um, you know, like, or I shouldn't even say agree to disagree. It's just totally different preferences and they don't interfere with each other. But I think that we feel like all of our influences have to interfere with each other's influences. That's what drives me crazy. Like, you're allowed to like both of them and and no one's right. There's no better. It's 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 not... You know, it's totally and or, you know? That's right. So, dude. It's the world we live in, man. It's the internet. Yeah, it's the it's sticking it to the man. <laughs> uh, That's but, right. Uh, but yeah, it is the world we live in. So, guys, you know, if you're listening to this, just project positivity on people around you. And really, you know, if, if you find something that I'm working on is when, when I find something's bothering me, Instead of reacting on that, I recognize that I am the one who's bothered. So that's my fault. That's my issue. No one can actually bother you. You know, you choose to be bothered. It's fascinating. I mean, I'm, I'm really getting into even NLP, like neuro linguistic programming, thinking about the way we work and the way we react to stuff. And I choose at the end of the day, how I want to feel in every moment. It's a choice. Some of it is subconscious. But even our subconscious programming is stuff that we've allowed to take place, you know. Some of us haven't. Some of us have been abused or dealt with things. And, you know, at this point, though, you need to become aware of those things and address them because they're your responsibilities, you know. So all that to say that it's like, man, we choose how to feel. So when you notice yourself getting frustrated with something, ask yourself why you feel threatened. Like like you said earlier, Jeff, why you feel threatened or why you feel bothered, you know. Like, is it fear that's making you bothered? Is it... You know, like, what is it? Really get to the heart of it. And I think all of us are going to be a lot more surprised and a lot more graceful with people around us when we feel bothered by them. And they, they don't even know you. They haven't done anything to try and bother you, you know? And it's especially, you know, drummers are listening right now. Musicians are listening. It's a, it's a hard profession, you know, if you're trying to make a living doing it. And I think we are confronted more than maybe normal with this kind of stuff of, you know, feeling inadequate you know, wondering what, what the next day is going to look like. Am I going to be able to keep doing this, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I would just say that those people who are feeling negative, uh, are feeling down and are negative towards others are just feeling unsatisfied in their own lives, you know? And I've been there. I, I will be there in a couple of weeks, maybe go on a mood. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just, uh, it's kind of recognizing that. And like, do you think that Stanley, you know, um, or, um, you know, Gillespie or these guys are negative towards people, you know, other drummers. I really <laughs> doubt it because they're fulfilled yeah. in their career, in their career path and their drumming. You know, I think that's where, where it's at. If you feel like you are on the right track, why are you going to be negative towards someone else? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's only, you kind of feel like you could be doing better. I think, dude, you know? I think that we got to do this again. I think that we've got to do another, another hang where we just, we chat about some more, uh, you know, some more subjects. I want to hear some, some questions from you guys. So if you're listening to this and there's something that you'd love to hear, you know, myself or Jeff talk about, please write us and let us know and keep us in the loop. Um, if you even have some videos you want to just have us check out of your own playing and see what we think or what our take is on it, we'd be more than happy to check that out and offer you guys, you know, either some input or just some encouragement. But, um, dude, it's been so awesome having you on the podcast, man. It's been so great getting to know you. And truthfully, so you guys know, I'm just getting to know Jeff. But he's someone that uh, we've crossed paths a lot on the internet, and we were long overdue. And I just said to Jeff, man, I think that you're sharing some great insight right off the cuff of our conversation, like 10 minutes in. 
let's make this a podcast and let's just be real and, and talk and you know and share with people. So, dude, it's been so great having you. You're super gifted, man. I think there's, uh, like I said earlier, I'm gonna you know recap to say that I think there's an amazing gig that's you know in your future, and I'm excited to do this now, not to capitalize on you, but to say that I really believe in you, and I think that uh, you know this podcast is gonna become even more listened to and popular in time. So let that be a prophecy for all you listening now. Who are you know maybe this is five years down the road you're listening to the Jeff Randall thing at 180 and you're like oh man <laughs> can you believe that the pot he was totally right you're welcome <laughs> you're welcome well thanks so much for having me Jake man I uh, I love what you guys are doing at 180 sincerely like because I can definitely see that you guys are you're asking those questions that I I would ask I'm like shouting through the screen ask him this please you know I don't awesome. need to know more about this you know so I really dig your guys' approach out there and. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, let's talk again. I would love to. Awesome. Jeff, thanks so much, man. Thank you. All right. Man, I hope that you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. I had so much fun hanging out with Jeff, you know, really just chatting, chatting about how awesome drums are and just falling in love with the instrument all over again in so many ways. So guys, uh, feel free. Check out the links and let us know what you guys think. Let us know how you're enjoying this podcast. Please rate us even in the iTunes store. Give us some give us some love there and leave some honest reviews. We'd be more than happy to, you know, get some love that way and support so that this podcast ranks high and other drummers discover it. Uh, we're all about, you know, truly trying to equip drummers and get the next generation ready and, you know, kind of get with the times. I mean, right now, guys, we live in the best possible time to be a drummer because there's just so much access to so many great things and that's a big part of our vision at 180drums.com is just to to give everybody the opportunity to learn from the best drummers and you know really ask the right questions not just throw them up and say go but sit alongside these drummers and that's kind of my job uh, you know as the host at 180 is to help guide the lessons so that they meet the stuff that I'm looking for that I think other drummers are looking for. So we just had a blast hanging out with Jeff today and really trying to ask him questions that we think you guys would find helpful. So reach out. Let us know what questions you'd like to know in the future. And you can do all of that by heading to 180drums.com forward slash Jeff Randalls. J-E-F-F-R-A-N-D-A-L-L. And letting us know what you guys think. So Awesome. We're uh, very excited to you know, be in episode three here, essentially, of the podcast, and just to continue to, to pour into this, and we look forward to the next. All right, guys, we've got some good ones on the way that we've already recorded with some, some heavy peeps, including Sticks from Ariana Grande, that's soon to be released, as well as Rich Redman from Jason Aldean and All Around Hustler. So, all right, y'all, love you guys. Talk soon. Later.